Well, grab your Bibles and let's go to Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 to 27 today, Mark chapter 12, verses 18 to 27, and uh, and let me uh, me just start reading, okay, because we've got a lot of work to do here this morning. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 to 27, and Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. The second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third, likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. What woman wouldn't after seven husbands? In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. And Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you, neither, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. I, uh, I love coffee, okay? Just, I drink a cup or two every morning. I've already had my cups this morning. Uh, I've got a cup sitting down there underneath my chair. I'll probably have more later. I like it even if it's cold. Um, but I'm not a plain coffee guy. I'm a cream in coffee. Now, now, when I say cream, I don't mean creamer, like the stuff that could survive a nuclear holocaust. I don't like that stuff. Um, I'm talking about half and half, right? I'm talking about the good, you know, it's real dairy. Um, I have no idea what's in the other stuff. I'm pretty sure it's going to kill us. But, uh, but, but listen, uh, I don't like it too bitter. I don't like it, you know, I don't like it too, too black, too, too white. I, 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 like it, I like it right there in the middle. So every morning, I go through the same ritual. I get up. I, I, I put my cup under hot water. I like my cup to be nice and hot. And I, I pour the coffee then into the cup. And I, I grab some half and half and I pour it in. And I love the aroma. You know, get it out of the refrigerator. Just, just love that. And, and then I sit down and I, I enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning. Okay? But then again, then, then, then every now and again, something happens. I'll, I'll get everything ready, get the hot water, pour everything, get it all ready, go to the refrigerator, get the half and half, pour it in. And to my shock and horror... Um, the, the cream that goes into the cup is like these little flecks and it is completely curdled inside the milk, right? Have you ever had this happen? And, and, and I don't know what possesses me to do this, but every time I have to then smell the carton to make sure, oh yeah, oh yeah it really is rancid. Uh, it really has gone bad. Uh, the nastiness in the cup wasn't enough for me. And, and, and so I, I sit there and look at it and I have completely ruined a cup of coffee. Okay, got to start over, got to figure out what I'm going to do now that I don't have cream. And uh, I don't know how this happens. I guess it gets left on the counter too long and, you know, can't fully recover, needs to be cold. And, but whatever happens, the end result is the same. My coffee's ruined um, and, and the cream has gone bad. Dairy does this, right? All right, what in the world are you talking about, Chris? Okay, well, <laughs> I, I, I want to show you something here. Like, like, like milk, like cream, like half and half, Um, what happens to those things, they go bad. The same thing can happen to theology, okay? It can go rancid. It can go really bad. Um, And that's what Jesus is confronting here in Mark chapter 12. And I want to show you this. Now, bad, wrong theology, okay? Why does it go bad? Well, I, I think there's lots of reasons. We're going to see some that Jesus identifies. But, but maybe the most common is that sometimes it just sort of wanders off track. Like you know that if you're leaving LAX and you're headed towards New York City or you want to, you know, you want to land in LaGuardia or whatever, you, 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 uh, you, it just takes a few degrees uh, off on your trajectory and you can end up in Miami, right? I mean, the, 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 the end result is going to be vastly different because you just got a few degrees off. And I think that happens with our theology. Now, you may have noticed 
You, you listen to the news or you watch programming or you listen to different preachers on TV or, or, or the radio or whatever, and you notice that people don't always agree on what the Bible says or on their theology. That is their understanding of God and doctrine and those kinds of things, which is why we have various denominations. Okay, We've got Baptists and Methodists and Episcopalians and Assembly of God, whatever. And, and because generally each of these denominations were formed because they had a hill, a theological hill that they would die on, okay? This is what we believe. This is our distinctive, a belief that is particularly important. Of them. Now, some of those are well-founded in Scripture, and, and others are not. And now, maybe that bothers some of you. Like, I, I don't like it that I listen to one preacher or I listen to one group, and they say this, and a different group, and they say that. And, and, and the more you're exposed to the broader culture of, of what people, you know, that call themselves Christian, the more you realize that, 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 that these beliefs are so different. Some of them are wildly different from another. And so you, you maybe ask yourself, why is that? Why does that happen? Why the radically different understandings of the same book? And is it possible to reconcile all those differences? Okay, let me give you the answer, and then let me explain. Is it possible to reconcile all those differences? The answer is no, it's not possible. See, see there are certain things being taught that are so fundamentally different from each other, they can't be true. Right? You understand this? They are mutually contradictory. Like, like either Jesus is God or Jesus isn't God. Either there is one God or many gods or no gods. Either there is a real hell or there isn't. Either there, Jesus rose from the dead or he did not. Okay, we don't, okay, we can't just say, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and let's all get along. We cannot affirm mutually contradictory things. See, see, like, look, my wife is my wife and I'm not Mormon, which means she's not going to be your wife. Okay, she can't be my wife and someone else's wife. Okay, that, that's not going to work or we have a problem and I have a shotgun, right? That, that's, not, that's not happening with Michelle, okay? See, some people are right and that means some people must be wrong. So how do earnest, passionate, religious, intelligent people come up with incorrect ideas about God. Or let's say it this way. How does good theology go bad? How does it go rancid? How does that happen? Because apparently it happens all the time. In fact, I bet it happens to you. And, and one of the people who teaches us that, and the reason we can say this with such confidence, is, is Jesus. Right here in Mark chapter 12. Now, do you see this? I just read it to you. We read it together. Jesus believed good theology can go bad. Jesus believed that earnest, zealous, religious, intelligent, studious people can come, come to totally wrong conclusions. Now, okay, so far we've seen Jesus interacting with the, I mean, he, talk about Talk about, you know, when it rains, it pours. I mean, Jesus, since the beginning of Mark chapter 12 and even earlier in chapter 11, has just been bombarded with opposition, right? I mean, he is now at the epicenter of the Jewish faith there in the temple and in Jerusalem. Remember, this is the last week of his life. And every day, every hour, he is being confronted by some new accusation, some new question, some new opposition, and he's had to deal with all kinds of questions, right? They've asked him about authority. They've asked him about politics. And now he gets a straight up question about scripture and theology. It's the first time we've seen that. 
And now I want you to notice, okay, so they come to him, Jesus, and this is this group of Sadducees, and I'll explain to you why in a second. They don't believe in the resurrection. They come to him, okay, we got this really kind of crazy story, and I'm sure this is, you know, kind of a gotcha, and they'd told this story before. So this guy, you know, this woman, and she's married to one guy, and he dies. And you remember Moses told us this thing called leveret marriage, where the brother is supposed to take his deceased brother's wife so that, so that the, the, the inheritance can go on through the brother's line, okay? So, so they have... Have children and they actually become the first brother's child. Well, they sit there and they, they, they come up with this absurd argument to say this, the resurrection can't possibly be true because if, if you have this string of seven brothers and you have one bride and you go to heaven and there's this resurrection, then what happens? What happens? I mean, they're all, all married because that's crazy. And so they think they've got him. And I want you to notice how Jesus then answers them. I want you to notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, guys, you're being too literal and too dogmatic and too propositional. This stuff doesn't really matter. He doesn't say, look, questions like this are irrelevant. What really matters is what you experience in your heart. He doesn't say, look, don't waste your time on all that theological, you know, questioning and looking at scripture. Just live the Jesus way. He doesn't say, how can anyone really know what's true? I mean, we're just blind men feeling different parts of the elephant and describing what we feel. So, you know, us Christians, maybe we're here on the trunk and we're describing it. If you're Buddhist, you're back here on the leg and, you know, maybe somebody else is feeling a tusk. And so, look, we're all feeling parts of the same elephant. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's just we're describing, we're describing the same thing. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say the right answer is whatever your community affirms, right? So the community, each community has to come together and decide, hey, this is right and this is wrong and this is how we understand scripture and that makes it right for us. He does not say that. He doesn't say what's most important is not some right answer, uh, but the process of discovering those answers in yourself, right? It's in you. He doesn't say, come on, guys, there are many correct answers, and you just need to find the one that fits you. He doesn't say, you know, I say tomato, and you say tomato, but they're both tomatoes. He doesn't say anything like any of those things that I just mentioned. What does he say? Twice. He gets a story, they ask the question, verse 24, what does he say? You are wrong. And just in case they missed it, verse 27, you are quite wrong. Now, I want, I want you to feel this with me. Okay, for, first of all, let me just say something. What he isn't saying is that, you know, is that we should now argue over every little point of doctrine and theology and get really, you know, upset about all kinds. Look, there there are in-house debates that we can have. Okay, there are things that good, responsible Bible interpreters come to different conclusions about. They believe in the inerrancy of scripture, they believe this is all true, and yet they come to slightly different conclusions. So look, you know, I, I've described to you some before, like when you think of doctrine, think of it like a, a target, okay? And you've got a bullseye in the middle, and you've got outer rings. And the bullseye is what makes the people Christian, okay? Like their beliefs are Christian. You know, the Trinitarian nature of God is in the bullseye. The two natures of Christ are in the bullseye. The, the, the uh, justification by faith alone through Christ alone, that's bullseye. We don't, we don't mess with that. You take things out of the bullseye and you, you ruin Christianity, but then there are things in these outer rings, and this is what makes people Baptist or Methodist or Episcopal, whatever, okay? These different outer rings. And so these are things that we say, hey, we, we can debate without dividing. We can debate 
whether spiritual gifts are for today. I believe they are, okay? Somebody else say, well, I don't. Let's talk about that, okay? We can debate the timing of end time events. You know, is it, is it you know, can we make the chart and, and does that all actually pan out that way? We can debate modes of baptism and talk about that, but we don't have to divide over them. That is not what's going on here. This is not an issue of, hey, you know, this is just an in-house debate. No, this is so important. Jesus is going to say, you're wrong. Man, you are quite wrong. Now, if you want to say, hey, you know what? I don't like talking about theology and doctrine and all that stuff. I feel like it just divides us. I just, I just like worship, man. You know, I just, I just like to feel God. And you kick theology to the curb. You kick doctrine to the curb. And it, you say it's not important <laughs> Uh, you will not find any sympathy for your position from Jesus. Because Jesus thinks there are some ideas that are right and some that are wrong and some that are so wrong they're deadly. Like some of you think theology and doctrine, right? That's, that's somehow opposed to genuine Christian faith. Okay, you, let, let me just say quickly. Everybody in here is a theologian. You understand this? What's a theologian? Somebody who thinks about God. Everybody has an opinion about who God is. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not, this isn't original to me. A.W. Tozer, <laughs> brilliant man, said, said this. What you think of when you think about God is the most important thought you will ever think because it will determine every other dimension of your existence. Now just let that one settle on you for a moment. Everybody thinks about God. Everybody thinks something about God. And what you think about God determines everything. You're all theologians. But some people go, I don't want to think like that, right? I, I, right? That, that, that Christianity is what I feel, it's what I experience. And hear me, I'm not negating that there's no experiential component. And I believe your affections are vital to your faith. But listen, People that talk like this or act like this, like theology and doctrine are important, it doesn't really matter. I just love everybody. It doesn't really care. I don't care that he believes that or that, whatever. Listen, you talk like that, then, then, then you're gonna get, we're going to get next week to the greatest commandment. Does everybody remember what the greatest commandment is? You shall love the Lord your God, Jesus is going to say, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. With your mind, you understand your, your mind is a tool for your faith. And, and some of us, you know, favor one over the other and just says, no, all of these have got to be true. We're, we're supposed to think and think hard and think deeply about God because what we believe about God matters. And so when someone says, you know, hey, two plus two can be four or five, we're like, no, it can't. It's four. You know, when somebody says the resurrection of the dead didn't happen, yes, it did. See, so you, you, you can't affirm that A is true and non-A is also true. You understand this? This is just logic. And I'm old-fashioned. You know, I was born in 1967. You can do the math. Uh, I'm 45, I'll just tell you. So, so... Uh, and I guess I'm old-fashioned enough to believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and there is no other way. Okay, now, so when my neighbor comes and says, well, I don't believe that. I think there are many ways. I can't say to her, you know what? You're right. That's okay. We're both right. I don't, I can't affirm her. Okay, well, I, either she's right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and she's wrong. You get this? And Jesus didn't say, hey, can't we all just get along and not argue about this stuff? He said, truth is important, and I got to defend it when it's on the line, especially when it's truth about God and what you're saying about God right now, Sadducees. So, how does it happen? How does good theology go bad? Where does it jump the rails? Let's look at this, and I want to show you this. We'll start in verse 24. 
okay, he's heard the question, the woman dies, and the seven had her as a wife. How, I want to show you some general ways Jesus is going to give us that theology goes bad. Okay, verse 24. Jesus, he answers them and he says this, is this not the reason you are wrong? Why? Here's the reason. Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Of God. You don't know. That's the first thing to say. You, you don't know the scripture. The reason theology goes bad is you don't know the scriptures. Now, now let me help you kind of kind of feel what's going on here. Jesus is talking to men who spent their entire lives studying scripture. <laughs> okay, so so the, these guys are PhDs. The Sadducees, here, here's the thing. They only believed that the first five books of your Bible uh, were inspired by God. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what's called the Pentateuch, or Penta meaning five. The Torah, you'll hear it referred to that way. Okay, this is the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And they said, this is the only thing we see as authoritative. And since we don't see any evidence of the resurrection in the first five books of the Bible, it's not true. Okay, they're, they're kind of like the King James only folks these days, you know, they're like, this is the only thing that's inspired of God. It can only, you can only read the King James Version because if it was good enough for Paul, then it's good enough for us, right? You'll get that later. So, so here's the thing. Many of them, this is unbelievable, by the way, many of them had, had memorized uh, massive portions or all of the first five books. I mean, look at this. Okay, okay. Any, anybody got this much of your Bible memorized? This is not easy stuff. This is not like it rhymes and you can sing it. Uh, they, 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 they knew the Pentateuch. They knew the Torah. They knew these books like the back of their hands. And Jesus looks them with all seriousness and says, you know what your problem is? You don't know the scriptures. Now, I don't know anybody in this room that would talk to somebody like that and say, see, their problem is they don't know the scriptures. What's Jesus saying? There's knowing and there's knowing. See, th let, me, let me try to put this in context for you. Like, just imagine. So I used to be an attorney, and I, I never actually did this, but let's just assume that, that I had to argue a case in front of the Supreme Court. And so I get up there, and it's a very formal process, and you stand there at the lectern, and it's your turn, and then the other guy's turn, and you go through this, and you're standing there, and let's say Justice Antonin Scalia, who's understood to be, you know, one of the brightest guys on the Supreme Court, let's, and, and he knows the law, and he's just brilliant. And let's suppose I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm talking, and and he interrupts me, you know, Counselor Lewis, I, I want to ask you a question. And he refers me to some question of the Constitution and says, you know, how does that fit? And I, and I say to him, you know, here's your problem, Justice Scalia. You don't know the law or the Constitution. He'd be like, what? And everybody in the courtroom would be like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> right? Now, okay, this, this, would be like, this would be like saying to Einstein, you don't know squat about physics. To a Wall Street banker, you know nothing about finance. You, you see this? Scriptures was the Sadducees stock and trade. This is what they did. They were the PhDs. It's what they specialized in. They spent their whole lives studying these scriptures and Jesus says, you don't get it. Now, you know what's interesting? And you make the application for yourself. These guys are not vulnerable at their greatest weakness, but at their greatest strength. How true is that? How many of us, because we're very strong in one area of our lives, feel like, I don't need God's input, or we, or we, or we live like this. And, and, and Jesus comes at them right at the place where they think they're brilliant, they're strong, they got it. So, so, so Jesus says, look, you're wrong. And so look what he does. First, he talks a little bit about marriage, okay, to show them, okay? You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven, okay? Not, 
Not if they rise, but when they rise. For Jesus, the resurrection's a fact. And he says, in heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, truthfully, I don't have time to unpack. And let's talk about what marriage looks like in heaven because I think that's kind of ancillary. But listen, it probably means, based on this and other places in Scripture, that marriage will not exist in heaven as we know it here. Okay, now, now for some of you, that makes you incredibly sad, and some of you are feeling giddy right now, right? Because I think, now, now this, is, this is why I think that one of the exceptions to the, you know, that we can get married, and it's biblical, and, and the Bible says this is perfectly fine, is if a husband or wife dies, the marriage is dissolved, and they're free to remarry. So apparently in heaven, I won't be married to Michelle. Okay, now, again, that makes me very sad, but, but uh, because I don't understand, but, but that apparently is what Jesus said. Again, I don't have time to, to chase that rabbit this morning, but so, so uh, sorry, let's keep going. Okay, now, look at, look at verse uh, 26. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? Okay, so in, in the passage about the bush, you understand that in these days, they, they did not have chapters and verses. That came along way after Jesus' time. And, uh, and, and, and so he's not saying, hey guys, remember back in Exodus chapter three, verse six, he says that like many scribes would do, remember the, the passage in Moses, first five books of the Bible, about the bush. So see what Jesus just did? He's gonna talk to them from scriptures that they understood, okay? And he says, um, he says, look, they prided themselves on being ultra conservative when it came to the scriptures. I mean, we take it literally, Jesus. We, we listen to everything scripture says, and there's no resurrection back there in those first five books. And Jesus says, no, 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 you didn't take scripture seriously enough. And I want to show you from the scriptures you think are authority, you, the only ones you say are authoritative. Because notice what Jesus does and how he's going to answer their argument about the resurrection. He is going to rest his entire argument on the tense of a verb. Now watch this. He says, remember that passage? What did God say to Moses? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Okay, not I was. Any of you Hebrew students, you'll know this. In other words, when God spoke, understand this, the context of that passage, if you go back to Exodus chapter three where God says that to Abraham, the, the context of those words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. They were all, as we know it, dead. And yet God still says, I am right now their God. He's not the God of the dead. Right? That doesn't do anything. They're all in caskets in the ground. Their bones are rotted. I'm not their God if that's the way they are. I am because they're with me right now. I am their God. So the resurrection is true. Now, you know what this tells me and what it ought to tell you? Every word of scripture is breathed out by God. We believe, Foothill Church, our doctrinal statement, if you go look at it on the internet, we believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of scripture. What does that mean? That every, we confess that every single word of scripture comes from God. And plenary means all of it. All of it has meaning. Every part of it inspired. The verb tense the grammar, it is that trustworthy. Which, by the way, I'll just make you a plug here. This is, this is why, you know, the Bible's in your pew, in your, in the pew, in the chairs. Uh, we, and I'm not saying this is the only translation out there, but we use a, a translation called the English Standard Version. Okay, why? Well, again, I don't have, I don't have time to give you all, but let me just say this. It's, a, it's incredibly accurate. Okay, when, when Bible translators go to work, like the NIV, let's take that, they'll say, okay, we want you to write and, and translate this Bible, but, but you, you got a ceiling, and your ceiling is about an eighth grade level of language. That's not a bad thing. I'm not, not, I, I think the NIV is a great translation. When they came to the ESV, they said, no, you, we'll take the handcuffs off. You use whatever word you need to use to make it accurate. So it's accurate, and it's readable. Okay, so, so, so we want to we wanna put into your hands, want to encourage you, whatever, you know, that you have a translation of Scripture that 
picks up on verb tenses and grammar and meaning. And you can know that when you read it, it is trustworthy. You can trust what you read as the word of God. Okay, but these guys had taken things external to Scripture and elevated them over Scripture. Okay, like, like you know, that's how they developed their theology. There's no resurrection. So rather than listening to what Scripture actually says and giving that authority, they take tradition, they take modern thinking of that day, and they put it above Scripture. They say things like, every generation needs to define what's true and not true, and needs to define what's important in Scripture and not. Every generation needs to decide what doctrine and theology is important to them. So Scripture becomes subservient. You see how this works? It becomes subservient to current trends, to cultural norms. And rather than being the compass that says, there's true north. I know I'm not pointing north, but just follow me. Okay, there's true north. What do we do? We say, no, let me try to figure out what I want to be true north and then wrap Scripture around my life to make me feel good about my decision. And we do this in all kinds of ways. Just in, you know, so, like, rather than listening to the teachings of Scripture and, and really going and figuring out if it's true, we accept what a denomination says, perhaps, without checking our facts. Now, look, I'm not against denominations. Please hear me. But I'm saying denominations are not authoritative. The Bible is. Or, or we take a tradition taught to us by pastors or something like that or you know parents even sometimes and we elevate it to the place well this must be true okay like I, I grew up just real quickly I grew up honestly believing now now whether my pastor intended this or not I'll just tell you when it came time to take the Lord's Supper and maybe some of you can relate to this I was told basically this First Corinthians chapter 11 says nobody better take partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner or else you could die. Read 1 Corinthians 11. So what that means, congregation, is that before you take the Lord's Supper, man, you better get everything settled with God and make sure there is no sin. Because it's a terrifying moment for me as a kid. I could die? What the heck, you know? So it's like, okay, okay, Lord, is there, forgive me of this and that and this and this and this and this. Okay, am I good? Am I good? Now, now I can hurry up. I'll take communion. Woo! And I can go back to thinking bad thoughts. For that brief moment, I was clean. For that brief moment, I was worthy. Okay, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That is not at all what it means. Worthiness has everything to do with the fact that you are partaking of the Lord's Supper in community. And it is elements that represent the body and the blood of Christ. And Paul is very angry at people that are rushing to the Lord's Supper, being gluttons. I don't care about all the people at the back of the line. This is all for me. This is just Jesus and me. It's my relationship with God. I don't really care about anybody else. And Paul says, that's unworthy. That'll get you killed. I mean, isn't, I mean, we go to communion to go, God, every week, every day, I blow this thing. And I know that I'm not worthy in that sense. But I come, and this represents to me the cleansing blood and body of Christ. Praise you, Jesus, that this cleanses me from all unrighteousness. That's what this represents. You see how we do this? I mean, we do it where some of you, you've gone away to college and you're at a Christian college and what happens? Man, you sit under these professors and they open up the scriptures and you're like, holy freaking cow. I didn't know that was in there. And you start accepting because you're thinking, man, these guys have PhDs. They must be right. They must be right. And I've seen it happen more than once. Some rogue PhD will shipwreck your faith. See, see, here's the thing. We don't elevate anything above Scripture. No teaching, no statement of faith, no creed, not your favorite author, not your favorite radio preacher, not your favorite, if I am or not, your pastor. No, no. Not a theory, not instruction. Nothing must supersede the Word of God. 
They, we, we better come under the word of God. This is why Paul commended the Bereans. He says to them, he, he says about them, what I loved about these guys is I went and I taught them the word of God. Then they went back, kind of huddled together and said, okay, let's look at scripture. Is that really true what Paul just told us? Paul says, you hold fast to what's true scripturally. In other words, we don't start with our theology and then wrap scripture around it. We start with scripture and theology must emerge from scripture. The Sadducees weren't doing this. Now maybe though, maybe for us there's a far, far more dangerous way that we do this. We let popular culture dictate and drive our theology. We let, we let popular opinion or media make our decisions and I want you to think about what's the message that we hear in culture over and over and over again to where I think it's white noise and we may not even hear it anymore. Think, think about this, right? Our culture basically says to you and me every day, you are awesome. I mean, you're the epicness of awesomeness. That's how awesome you are. You, baby, you're a firework, <laughs> right? You got a spark inside, you got to let it out. That's where the truth is. Now tell me I'm wrong. This is every Disney movie I've ever seen. <laughs> Follow your heart. Because, man, your instincts will lead you in the right way every, we're, we live in a culture of narcissism. In other words, the culture says to you, right? Baby, you're a firework. You're awesome. There's nothing wrong with you at all. So the way you are is the way you ought to be. You see this? No change is necessary. Follow your instincts because they will always lead you in the right direction. Now, let me just say something. I, that can't possibly be right. And you know this. You, you know this whether you're a Christian or not. Because look, I, I just spent three days with a group of fifth graders, about 60 of them, on Catalina Island. And I'm telling you right now, if we just said, follow your instincts, do what feels right, it would be Lord of the Flies. <laughs> no sleep, Red Bull, you know, warheads, this would be their diet, this is what they would do, and it would go crazy, right? I mean, this is what happens if they followed their instincts. I mean, parents, you're like, my, you know, everybody thinks their kid's so cute and awesome. I'm telling you, they're not as awesome as you think they are. Okay, you leave them to their instincts, they'll go crazy. And look, you know this, because you're like, man, I didn't teach them to eat warheads, Right? In fact, I try to get them not to do that stuff. Oh, 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 you mean your kid's heart doesn't lead them in the right direction automatically? Surprise, surprise. Right, I've told you before, like I came in one day, two of my little children were in the bathtub. They shall remain nameless. And one had bites all over on the back. Now, listen, I, okay, I never, ever, they never, they didn't learn that from me. Like, you know, I get mad, rah, and I bite somebody. <laughs> okay, they're not as awesome as we think they are. We're not as awesome as we're told we are. Now, here's the problem. If you swallow that poison, you swallow that message that the culture is sending you and you don't know the scriptures, guess what will happen? You'll die. Okay, because the Bible says you were born totally infected by a disease, let's call sin. 
and you are not okay, and I'm not okay, and the way I am or was before Christ is not the way I ought to be. I am broken. I know it. You know it. We all know we're broken, which is why you can go to a bookstore, and there's a massive section on self-help because we know there is something terribly wrong with us. And so what do we do? Because you don't know the scriptures. You can't, you won't challenge the prevailing message. You have no ability to do that and you'll die you'll die because it's telling you what the antidote is but the culture is telling you something totally different you don't know the scriptures but there's one other thing he tells us and that is you don't know the power of God you see this what Jesus says this is the reason you guys are mistaken you don't know the scriptures you don't know the power of God see even apart from scriptures The Sadducees ought to have seen all those miracles in the Old Testament. Parting of the Red Sea. I mean, the plague sent, rescuing God's people. Light over in Egypt, but not over on Israel. I mean, uh, light over on Israel, darkness in Egypt. I mean, over and over, the way that God showed, showing up and giving them manna in the wilderness, just falling out of heaven, quails that come, a, a pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day, all these miracle after miracle, a voice from the mountain. They saw these things, the, the earth open up and swallowing people. They saw these things. And if you just believe in the first five books of the Bible, Jesus says, I can't believe you don't see the power of God and understand God could raise people from the dead if he wants to. They, they had a wrong view of God. So Jesus says, you're wrong because you don't believe God is able to do what seems impossible to you. Your view of what God could do is your own limitations. You've boxed God in. Now, this is not to say, hear me, this is not to say that God therefore does anything we want him to do. Right, you understand this. That Jesus' point isn't uh, that, 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 that it's, you, know, you can get all you want. Scripture still has to be our guide. There is a difference between God's ability and God's willingness. You understand There's a difference between saying God can do X and God will do, must do X. No, he he doesn't have to. He'll sometimes do it. He'll sometimes tell you, no, I won't do it. He'll sometimes say, wait, I'm going to do it later. And none of it diminishes his glory or his goodness. He knows he's sovereign. See, is there anything too hard for God? That's what Jesus is saying. Is there anything, really seriously? Is there anything you deem impossible that God, you feel like God cannot do? This is the God who caused light to shine out of darkness. This is the God who fed 5,000 people with a couple of happy meals. This is the God who, who told the sea, the sea was unruly, and he stood up and like to a child, shut up, boom, it got soft. I mean, just boom, quiet. This is the God who healed people. They came to him and with a word, he says, be healed. And they were healed. This is the God who raised a little girl from the dead just by his words. Listen, if you really believe in a God like that, not just some flannel board story that you heard in Sunday school, you believe it. Then you believe in the power of God. And here again, you know why we don't believe many of these things? Because we don't know the scriptures. We don't saturate ourselves in the word of God. See, because look at what you believe about these miracles. What you really believe about these miracles is what you believe about God. Is he a God with power? Or not? Does God have the power to break your addiction? Yes. Does God have the power to sustain you through suffering? Yes. Does God have the power to save the hardest people that you can imagine? Yes. Does God have the power to provide for your needs today? Yes. Does God have the power to take your marriage that you feel like is over and actually bring healing? Yes. Does God have the power to change you Yes. Is there anything too hard for God? No. So, so, so you know what we need to strive to become, Foothill Church? You know what you need to strive, strive to become as a, as, as a believer? And if you're not a believer, you, sh- you need to be. You know what you need? 
We need to be people that serve a big God and have open Bibles. We, we need to be people who love our Bibles and love the massive God that it tells us about. People who celebrate him and the work he has done in us and through us and for us. People who realize that we were lost, but our big, gracious, loving, powerful, merciful God came to rescue and resuscitate dead people and save us and forgive us and cleanse us and fill us with his Holy Spirit and and empower us for living now and give us a home with him and Jesus and people in heaven. Theology is is really, really important. Because what you think of when you think about God is the most important thought you will ever think because it will determine every other dimension of your existence. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, I, 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 it's times like this when I'm, I'm just so grateful that I can hold a Bible in my hand, the Word of God, and I can have confidence in it, and I can know that when I read it, I hear, I hear with 100% certainty from God. I pray, God, we would be people of your Word and people who believe wholeheartedly in the power of God. I pray if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Jesus Christ, not not just know about him, but have a relationship with him that comes from repenting of their sin, turning from that, and turning to Jesus Christ in faith, believing that's the only thing that's gonna save me, not being good, not being religious, not even reading our Bibles, but coming to that point of decision where we say yes to God and and turn away from sin and turn to Jesus. God, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that hasn't done that, today would be the day. They would not harden their heart against hearing from God, but this would be the day of their salvation. God, we praise you, we thank you. I pray for anybody in this room, God, that is struggling with wondering whether you are as powerful as this book portrays you to be. God, show them your might, show them your power. Be with them and help them and reveal yourself gloriously to them, even in the midst of suffering. God, we love you, we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name.